Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stan Goldenberg, and uh, I am really uh, feel privileged to moderate this panel. And as with all the scientific panels, we're dealing with a number of experts, and I encourage you to read their bios. I'm going to keep the intro short to give more time for them to talk. Uh, but the bios are conveniently all on page 14 and 13 of your program book. And as with most of the scientists here, they are recognized in their field, have published papers, have spoken, have done research for decades. Uh, we're not dealing with a bunch of newbie fringe scientists. And many of you who have been to other conferences are familiar with these gentlemen. Uh, to open this uh, particular session, uh, we're going to start off with Dr. Soon. And basically, all I'll say is he is an astrophysicist and geoscientist based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and very distinguished in, in his field. And without further ado, we'll let Dr. Soon begin. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can we turn on the slide now? Yeah. As you can see, I'm, uh, we have a bit of a competition, so I try to make my title as... Uh, as astounding as possible, but it's all true. I'm just going to tell this story on this amazing CO2 obsession that is going on. And then this evidence of this giant boa snake that is uh, 2,500 pounds and uh, maybe 40-some three feet, that they claim that is the evidence where CO2 can go as high as 4,000 parts per million, which is not true. And then, of course, I want to talk about the sun, which is my main area of scientific research for 21 years. And the most important thing I should say here is that I'm here as an independent scientist, and I'm very proud of this title because all scientists should absolutely be independent, especially in terms of funding. And I uh, also want to acknowledge the contribution of this particular work, a small part of it, where I work with the great professor David Legates from University of Delaware, whom most of you may know. So let me start by this slide because I think there's a lot of talks about what CO2 could do and could not do. So the first question that has been sort of uh, on everybody's mind is that what has the temperature and climate trend has been doing for the past two to three decades? Did they go according to this CO2 plan? Okay. So let's buy some insurance and have a check with Peter Glick. <coughs> <laughs> this is actually his very last article around Forbes magazine where you can clearly sense the frustration where well, I think he's almost shouting through his paper that, I, I mean, the paper didn't get broken, but I read it. It's really loud. He said that this planet is warming, and then it's just about every institution, every national academy of sciences on the planet and, and societies in geosciences agree. I guess we are not so far off from that sort of statement. It's a reasonable statement, except still we need to understand what causes it, right? Uh, the NASA people has uh, told us that we should frame this thing as a human cause, global warming, but is it, is it really human cause or, or CO2 cause? So let's have a check. Science is this endeavor of uh, self-checking. What I'm showing you is basically two curve with the trend plotted on it, the dotted line. The black curve is actually what the climate models are predicting. Okay, It's talking about northern land temperature, northern hemisphere land temperature anomalies from 1988 to symbolize uh, the prediction started by the great Jim Henson of NASA, and the observed trend. My God, what is Willie Soon showing here? Peter Glick is absolutely correct. The globe is kind of warming, and then, of course, if you look much more closer, you will see that the last 10 years or so, maybe the trend is a little bit uh, less sharp. But like I try to insist, science is never, ever about all these votings and uh, all this consensus and the shouting match. It is very unfortunate that things have turned so ugly that we really have to even defend some of this statement to keep repeating and reminding people what science is all about. Okay? It's all about data. It's what the data is saying. What I showed you before was just the NO mean. So you take January to December, you just sum it up, have a yearly point, and then you plot them all. Now I'm showing you the northern, same northern hemisphere temperature, but for the month of December, January, and February. In the northern hemisphere, this is known as winter. <laughs> and now, please look at the black curve, which is the computer models, the, the, the group of average of the 10 climate models that will be used for the next IPCC AR5, which is going to due out in 2013. 
And then let's ask ourselves where the winter temperature is actually doing. Do you guys see the red trend, the red line there? It's actually zero, the trend. Okay, and the predicted trend is actually 0.5 degrees Celsius per 10 years. So that means 5 degrees for, for 100 years. That's a pretty severe warming trend. <laughs> I'm sorry, just, just because of this internal inconsistency, unless, of course, the data is completely wrong, yes? We have no way to try to say that this whole uh, idea about CO2 forcing the climate system to warm. And notice that this is the winter season. This is the only season that actually they strictly predict that this ha has to warm the winter temperature because you have less of the solar radiation, which is the short wave radiation versus the infrared part of it, right? This is where it's supposed to happen, and it's not happening. Again, this is not my work. Please understand. I'm just trying to motivate you and try to tell you what's going on here. And this is based on these people who really believe in CO2 causing global warming. So look at the, the this is the trend of the map, the temperature trend. You will see large part of the globe. Some part of it is red, which is warming, but large area of it, especially in uh, Europe and Central Asia, where you have this blue uh, cooling trend. So that, that itself, I mean, just raises a whole bunch of questions. But I come to talk to you something about more, even more exciting and fundamentals, which is about how actually the climate system actually operates. The basic fundamental question, oh, oh well, first of all, how does this boa snake going to fit in, right? <laughs> we got to have boa snake anyway. First thing I want to show you is basically this temperature record that is produced by the University of East Anglia Climatic Research Unit, which stands for CRU, where I'm just showing you the two versions of the results that they show. There's a slight change, of course, because if you look very, very carefully, you, you will see that uh, 1998 was no longer the warmest year in the new data sets, right? Now, 2005 is one of those warmer than 1998 data. But anyway, those slight change doesn't matter for my purpose. I only want to show you that the, the, the data are reasonable, that we have this best possible way of uh, coming out with the data. But this is actually a global mean temperature plot. And if we were to follow Professor Richard Linzen, which is clearly my heroes in this topic, I really, really think that he's the master of this climate dynamics question. So I'd like to put out the a work that he has actually written down about 20 years ago now. So this thing was written in 1993, so it's about 20 years. So he asked the question that you have to answer in terms of understanding global climate change. Scientifically, it requires us to answer two very far more fundamental questions, regardless of what the politic is. So the first question is what determines the mean temperature of the Earth? Remember, in science, the questions are very easy to ask but difficult to answer. And then the second question, which I'll focus here, is what determines the equator to pole temperature distribution of the Earth's surface? I know it's a mouthful. It's just basically trying to tell you why is it that the tropic is warmer than the, the Arctic? And then also, why is it that sometimes Arctic could be 10 degrees Celsius? We know that because we have seen crocodiles uh, fossil, we see palm trees fossils and all that stuff, 58 million years ago, let's say. How does that happen? Is it because of CO2 again? So let's have a look. So, but the, the main point about trying to talk about the global mean temperature versus this temperature gradient, what I call the equator to both temperature gradient, is exactly trying to focus you on this statement that is coming out from Professor Rinzen, which is to say that there are good reason to view the changes in the mean temperature of the Earth as the residual terms arising from the change in the equator to pole temperature distribution. In English, it just simply say that this second question is far more important than the first question. So this is the plot, taking the same set of data that you saw before that has this really things that look like it's going up, it's warming. But if you look in terms of this temperature gradient from equator to the Arctic, look at what happened now. You kind of don't have the extreme high warming near the end, right, present time. And then now your 40s and the 30s are a bit similar to what is happening right now. This is not magic. This is just uh, the, the facts. So this is actually one of the latest paper. In fact, very few people study this question. It's amazing, that, but the question is very important. So what you can see is that the, the, the 1870 to 1940 part is similar to the post-76 time. So here, the ultimate answer then is basically saying that this change in the mean temperature appears to be a byproduct of these uh, changes rather than a cause. So that's what Linzen has said. So here, here's where they found this fossil in Colombia. 
the boa snakes. <laughs> it's kind of true because they say the warm time produce bigger snakes, right? Well, we have a paper that came out in Global Change Biology in 2012 saying that global warming can possibly turn tiny bird into big bird. I thank uh, Anthony Watt for this graphic. But then, wait, not true. There's another paper that says that this horse come from this small little animal during the global warming time, let's say the, the Pliocene Eocene thermal maximum 56 million years ago, that you actually have the ancestor of horse is really very small in size. So this is actually the plot. They basically got a data, they got about eight fossil of these snakes. And then they kind of showing you on the bottom there, these snakes is actually, like I say, 43 feet and uh, 2,500 pounds estimated from this fossil. And then they would be able to get the tropical temperature. And they estimate it to be 30 to 34 degrees Celsius. That is very, very warm in the tropics. The, the temperature today is roughly 26 to 27. Okay? This is where the idea is went wrong. So first thing they look is that they put carbon dioxide into the system, see whether they can produce this temperature trend. You notice that they put the temperature that is extremely high. It's 2,200 to 4,480 parts per million. The thing I want to focus you is that they're actually able to show the tropic go up to 50 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> the first problem is that they need to get the Arctic to be warm, so they were able to get that. But every time they increase the Arctic, they get the tropics too warm. And then they're trying to get rid of this well-known principle now that they, perhaps there's a tropical thermostat mechanism that allows the tropic not to overheat itself. Okay? And that is the work by Dick Linson and even Willie Sessionbach is actually contributed to these ideas here. What I'm trying to show today is something very exciting, which I'll go, but three major problems with this scenario. First, the CO2 level, excuse me, it's, it's no more than 2,000. These people are putting in 2,240, uh, as high as 4,400. Second, for the snake thermometer, they have only eight fossils, but then they are neglecting the same fossil that you found for the plants, which they have close to 859 samples versus eight. That shows you that the fossil interpretation for the uh, fossil plants is actually six to eight degree cooler, which is telling you that the tropic is more or less the same like today. But they would really want to put all their bets on this little sampling. You know, it's an issue of selective result, by the way. And then more important is that why if the tropic is so, so hot, right? Why is the temperature gradient is still about the same today, like 50 million years ago, 60 million years ago? So this is actually a way to reconstruct the carbon dioxide level. And I just on purpose show you the 2000 level. And there's just no data come close to that over this time period from about 150 million years to about 60 million years ago. So I'm sorry, first of all, they got problem. But please, you know these people are really government paid scientists. They say, but the 4,400 kind of CO2 should not be construed literally. This is the kind of normal pain now that actually every time you open a scientific paper, you read things like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they actually put it in the model and then they say, but you know, you shouldn't, you, know, you shouldn't take the number seriously. My God, if science could really be work like that, just like all these NASA people are telling you, then you will have all this Apollo program that would never send a man to the moon, it would be crashing all the time. <laughs> and then the fundamental problem is this gradient, okay? I gotta go because I'm uh, running short of time. So. The, this is the big problem. How do you maintain same gradient where your temp tropic is so warm? It's impossible, actually. So I want to come back to this small little hint that I have. Just a picture of the sun, and this is actually a picture taken by Jack, right? The Apollo astronaut on December 7, 1972, where they took off, going heading to the moon, looking down, seeing the South Pole and Africa. Same curve again. Now I show you my hint, which is this curve, the red curve. The red curve is the Estimate of the sun's changes in the solar irradiance for the past 150 years or so. This is a very, very exciting result because what it tells you is that it has a very efficient mechanism to transfer energy from equator to the pole and warm it up. Because in their fundamental assumption, there's a well-known uh, principle in climatology. It's called Biagnes Compensation Rule, which is to say that every time if the atmosphere transfers more heat to the pole, the oceans slow down so that the total heat transport is constant. But what I've pro just proven here is that no, the total thing can go up and down modulated by the sun. This will change the whole paradigm. In fact, I would say that you, if you include such a mechanism in the 60 million year scenario, you have a very efficient way to actually warm the Arctic 
yet you keep your topic not too, not too warm, not overly heated, okay? so that your gradient actually reduce, not increase. Okay? So this is the exciting result that the paper that I just submitted already. So therefore, I don't want to distribute this graph because you know, they will come under technical thing. I usually will say, take everything you want. But you know, they will say, oh, we won't let you, uh, you know, publish this thing because you, know, you just showed this in Heartland Institute meeting. Yeah. <coughs> Anyway, I want to finish off. Sorry, I have something really important to say. That's why I want to tell you. So CO2, where to find this? Well, we all know that CO2 is this satanic gas, don't we know? <laughs> because plotted as a 666. I mean, it's roughly at the wavelength. <laughs> right? But the question is that do we have scientific data to test this idea? Emission in this infrared 666 or wavelength? Yes, we do. We have two sets of data from... 1970 and 1997, so it's a long bench line, almost uh, right. like you can see here, it's about 27 years. It's in the tropics. The solid line is the observation. It's showing you that as you increase the CO2, the temperature emission at that wavelength, the 666 thing is increasing rather than decreasing according to the model. This is what I call the fingerprint test. You just don't even see this. So how are we supposed to believe in CO2 actually? It's just not there. So, I want to tell because there was some student here, I just simply want to tell everybody, remind everybody, please remember, if you want to study greenhouse gas, what do you study? Water vapor, period. And cloud, of course, because they are a couple. Can never be separated easily. This is actually a plot of the water vapor that's actually measured by satellite with the MSU data. Not many people plotted this. I just plot it for fun, of course. It's a very, very close... Uh, a powerful control by water vapor greenhouse effects. Now I want to say something which I'll finish off. I promise you. This one is about the arrogance of these people who talk about greenhouse effect day in, day out. And they always focus on CO2, CH4, and then nitrous oxide. Bean counting. They even count CFC now, okay? But then, what is the major constituent in the atmosphere? Nitrogen and oxygen. It's been almost like a ground rule, they say. See, N2 and O2 molecule, which is the dominant, 79% versus 20% or something, that it exerts almost no greenhouse effects, according to IPCC, according to every single textbook you can find. But for the sake of the student and the education, for the whole truth, is that actually there is a way to produce greenhouse effect. These molecules, although they, they have diatomic, so they won't be able to do this vibrational and rotational thing like, like what uh, Scott Danning is like to dance around, to show you that they can... Uh, create actually infrared absorption spectra. So what I'm trying to show you is that there is this new paper that just came out that shows that you have this greenhouse effect. And here is the transmission feature for the O2 and N2 molecule. The top, you have the CO2 and the water vapor, of course. What is the number? Ultimately, it's about number. So how large is this effect? This effect is not good when you have a lot of water vapor, but it's very, very good, very strong in the place like Antarctica where it's very dry. Okay? It accounts up to 38% of the whole Antarctica greenhouse effect compared to the CH4, which is they consider important. At individual location, it accounts up to 80%. Okay? That tells you that the textbook has to change. This effect is real because it's through collision-induced absorption. So you can, you can really create greenhouse effects of N2 and O2 diatomic molecule. So case closed. They really don't know what they're talking about half of the time. So, but then the student is still around as usual. You always see this kind of caveat, right? That it's not important, but you know, we're not trying to change IPCC and so on and so forth. So I'll finish it, three take home points. Sorry, I ran out of time. But it's very obvious that the sun effect should be studied and we're making great progress. And then this idea about CO2 control now, I'm sorry, it's just not there. And then finally, if you look at climate models performance, I'm sorry, they fail very, very badly. They are not even passing the smell test. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.